So let's talk about usable histories. It's about 20 years since I first encountered the term, and though it occurs infrequently in historical discussions, it is an important concept. The term enjoyed a brief popularity in the 1990s, particularly in the study of women and minorities, which is also where I encountered it while writing a book review. And I was reminded of that recently because I was reading Rita Grosser's book Buddhism After Patriarchy from 1993, in which usable history is a central organising concept. So what is a usable history? This is a definition given by Charles Wallenberg. A usable history must consciously link past and present, not to impose contemporary values and viewpoints upon the past, but to help our students to understand the historical roots of present conditions. So a usable history is one which has lessons for us. It informs our decisions or our understanding. As Wallenberg hints, usable history is more than just a useful story. And one way this is expressed is to pair the term with another, more widely used concept. Rita Gross uses the term accuracy. Accurate history, she says, is always preferable to inaccurate history, simply because of its accuracy. In a statement that seems like a truism, but was actually under quite serious attack when she wrote it. This was the early days of the trend for postmodernism. But, she notes, as a feminist, she wants to study a past that provides useful lessons for our contemporary understanding of Buddhism, as well as accurately depicting what Buddhists have done or thought. And in this context, for a past to be both usable and accurate requires selection, but never distortion. This is not the same as being revisionist, and it is certainly not propaganda. Let's take an example from Rita Gross's area of interest. She depends for her understanding of the Buddhist order of nuns in India on an article by Nancy Falk called The Case of the Vanishing Nuns. Buddhism originated in India before the 3rd century BC, though scholars disagree over exactly when. Relatively early, it developed an order of renunciants who lived separately from its lay devotees, and that order persisted to the 11th or 12th century when Buddhism vanishes from our sources. Yes, you will see Buddhists in India today, but they are either converts in the 20th century or Buddhist orders from other countries. Falk began by noting how nuns disappeared from the sources a long time before other Buddhists, either monks or lay donors. She wondered why this had happened and offered one possible explanation connecting the decline with an economic collapse in the 3rd century AD, resulting from the end of Indo-Roman trade. Whether there was in fact a decline in trade or an economic collapse are hotly contested issues. I've talked a little about this before, and scholarship has moved on since 1989. But this isn't really important for Falk's main point. She argued that economic pressure would not affect monastic orders equally, that the monks would be able to retain their resources by depriving the nuns of theirs, and that the reason for this could be traced to the eight special rules that according to legend the Buddha had imposed on the women as a price for allowing them to found their order, which Falk points out, and most scholars agree, existed to ensure they would be permanently subordinated to the men. Thus the subtitle of the article the fruits of ambivalence in ancient Indian Buddhism, because she argues that a subtle discrimination resulting from social discomfort with women's independence led to this premature decline. I've seen criticisms of this article, which I think are mostly unfair, but Rita Gross does raise an important issue in that it places the emphasis on the Buddha's decision to impose special rules and wider society's assumptions. It is effectively depriving the nuns of any agency, and for this reason, she suggests that this story should not be considered usable because it reflects conventional notions of a woman's place, not the possibilities opened up by Buddhism. So as an alternative, let me offer you a slightly different sketch of the history of the Order of Nuns. We do not know exactly when the Order of Nuns was founded, 
But when Buddhism first appears prominently in the archaeological record in the 1st century BC, they share, with monks and lay donors, a major role in mobilising financial resources for construction work at both Barhut and Sanchi, the two early sites which have well-published epigraphic records. And nuns did not simply mobilise financial support. They seem to have played a major part in the spread of Buddhism to new regions and the spread of new ideas. One nun, Buddha Mitra, in the 2nd century AD, with her teacher, a monk by the name of Bala, seems to have introduced the practice of portraying the image of the Buddha in human form to the middle Ganges, a major development in Buddhist art. And according to surviving historical chronicles, the establishment of Buddhism in Sri Lanka depended on nuns. The story is quite interesting. As told by the chronicle, a monk named Mahinda was approached by the Sri Lankan queen to ordain her and her ladies-in-waiting. He explained that he could not do this himself, and so he invited a nun, Sangamita, to perform the ordination. According to the chronicle, it was Sangamita's efforts, not Mahinda's, that led the king to dedicate the land on which the Mahavira was built. The Mahavira is the monastery in which monks later wrote about this. Even in Gandhara, where Buddhism spread in the early centuries AD, and where our evidence is overwhelmingly of monks, women in the royal families of the Apraka and Odi took an active part in promoting the new religion. And at least one lady, named Uttara, became a nun. In all of these places, as Falk suggests, the order receded from public view and had become largely invisible by the 5th or 6th century. In fact, when Chinese women wished to found their own order of nuns, they were able to acquire a copy of the rules from Kashmir, but no nun was available to carry out the ordination. We know that because a Chinese writer later penned a set of 65 lives of prominent nuns from the period in which Buddhism became popular in China. Throughout Buddhist history, down to and including the spread of Tibetan Buddhism to the United States, in which Rita Gross herself participated, women, specifically nuns, have played a prominent an important part. In many cases, certainly in China and the US, the order has been effectively refounded. And yet despite this, the order of nuns has rarely survived to maturity, or if it has, only in a substantially reduced capacity. And that short summary refocuses the question. Instead of discussing the decline of the order, which inevitably raises questions of how men pushed the nuns to the margins, and instead focusing on how the nuns played a prominent part in so many moments of growth and transmission, despite every society I've just discussed being deeply patriarchal, it raises the question of how women were able to forge a space for themselves. It throws the focus on the agency of women rather than the attitudes of men, and therefore presents the historical data, which has often been overlooked, in ways Rita Gross might describe as more usable. You won't find this story in many histories of Buddhism. Even feminist accounts tend to focus more on identifying misogyny and the effects of patriarchy than on asking the equally important question of how women exercised their own agency. And I want to draw attention to something which is an important side effect of looking for usable histories. It does not just maintain accuracy, it often improves it. Falk's article is quite partial in terms of what it covers, which is not bad, it's intended to only look at one problem. But you get a more complete picture once you look at the other side as well. And that's a key insight, an account of Buddhism that takes more interest in women's agency, as well as reactionary forces, is probably more usable in the early 21st century, when we are living through reactionary responses to legal gender equality but it is also a more accurate history. So, a usable history is just a modern novelty reflecting political correctness or some other inclusivity agenda. The answer is no. It is entirely understandable to think that impartial accuracy has long been the goal of serious historians and that usability is a new idea. But it's not. Usability is a very, very old idea and accuracy is the novelty. 
It's not until the 19th century and the confluence of sub-disciplines like archaeology, epigraphy and philology with theoretical advances like the notion of primary sources that it becomes really practical to talk about improving or refining the accuracy of an historical account. Only with the German historian Leopold Rank does the idea of telling it how it was become something historians aspired to. Oh, before that you can certainly be inaccurate. But since you couldn't really improve on previous good attempts, you could only really distinguish yourself by thinking about what your history is useful for, what lessons or insights it might give in the present. For example, the oldest Chinese historian we have some good knowledge of, Sima Xian, in the 2nd century BC, records that his father encouraged him to undertake his history out of fear that the moral exemplars of previous generations might be lost. Yes, there's a huge irony here that in a presentation about a concept most frequently associated with feminist studies, that most historians agreed with this principle for thousands of years, but they've used it to draw moral lessons about how rich, privileged men should leave, live their lives. Now, this would usually be the point in one of these short pieces where I then talked about the counter-arguments and dangers of this theoretical position. In this case, there aren't any. Yes, there's always a danger in finding the answer you want rather than the one your sources support. And 20 years ago, I was naive or reactionary enough to think that was a problem with usable history rather than just an example of doing history badly. But the key point is that to be a usable history rather than a postmodern one is to also be an accurate history. Sure, you can be accurate without being usable, but you cannot be usable without being accurate. And as I've already suggested, pursuing usable histories often makes accounts more accurate. Why is that? Well, a final example involving Buddhist nuns might help. By the beginning of the 20th century, historians had gained access to a host of new sources relating to monastic life in South Asia. Translated texts, inscriptions, archaeology, and almost immediately, this began to be reflected in the papers people were writing. This bar chart shows the number of papers in a large database which mentioned Buddhist monks up to 1970, and you can see the slow but steady response to that new evidence. Guess what happens if I plot papers mentioning nuns? That's right, the number of papers is so small I had to mark it above each bar, and more importantly, it does not change. Historians are unresponsive to new evidence. And yes, the evidence does say more about monks than nuns, but it says plenty about nuns, and that gets ignored until 1970. After 1970, historical writing about Buddhist nuns begins to reflect the change in evidence that really began in 1900. But not because of the change in the evidence, but because of women's liberation in the USA and the effect that had on who historians are and the degree to which they felt existing histories spoke to them. To focus on the authors I've already mentioned, Nancy Falk received her PhD from the University of Chicago in 1972, and Rita Gross got hers at the same institution in 1975. I bet I could do a whole episode on the University of Chicago. By trying to write histories that spoke to them, usable histories, these people made history more accurate. And that is so often the case, it feels like it ought to be encouraged. If the existing history does not speak to you, if it is not a usable history, then ask how it could be. You'll probably end up making it better. Thank you.